Hello and welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice Podcast. My name is Ralph Cree. This is brought to you in association with bodyheartmindspirit.co.uk. Today I spoke to Christopher Harish Wallace about his new book called Near Enemies of the Truth. Avoid the pitfalls of the spiritual path and become radically free. This is his newest book and he's previously written books called Tantra Illuminated and the Recognition Sutras. He is a scholar practitioner of non-dual Shaiva Tantra, which is a roughly thousand year old tradition um, from India. Um, He also teaches uh, non-dual Shaiva Tantra, has a website that's full of resources that we give a link to um, we mentioned in the video and uh, also I will put in the show notes so what is a near enemy of the truth Um, well near enemies of the truth is something that is very close to being profound but just slightly misses the mark Uh, I mean Harish goes into uh, an in-depth definition of that in the conversation <clears throat> but he's in his book he has 17 near enemies of the truth um, I'll just list them quickly for you follow your bliss speak your truth be your best self be in the moment listen to your heart love yourself everything happens for a reason everything happens for the best find your soul's purpose you credit your own reality you can choose how to respond negative energy and negative emotions I am my own guru the universe is giving me a sign and go with the flow so these are examples of uh, what he refers to as near enemies of the truth which are when they're adopted as spiritual platitudes by common culture um, they uh, take you they kind of veer you off slightly in the wrong direction from the actual profound truth that uh, if understood um, correctly they will point you towards so i hope you enjoy this conversation i certainly did and uh, may it serve you in your spiritual practice christopher harish wallace welcome to the evolving spiritual practice podcast thank you good to be here yeah wonderful um it's, it's a it's a real delight for me because i have been following your work quite closely for a few years now um and it really helped me a a particular time for me uh i think i'd ended up a bit with a sort of uh a bit of an uh a splitting but spirit matter split kind of conundrum uh and the non-dual tantra which is what you teach um really helps um re- well resolve for the moment <laughs> that issue for me um as so i've been really into your work uh f- for for a while and you've you're a scholar practitioner which i think is a wonderful thing and i've interviewed for those listening ben williams who also is a s- scholar practitioner in uh tantra um which i think is a wonderful combination um because quite often you get one but not the other um and you've you've read you've written some great books which um i've read uh, the recognition sutras was a translation you've done which is my currently my favorite uh, spiritual text of all time which i've, I've read a couple of oh. times and i probably will read on and off for the rest of my life i imagine you tantra illuminated which is a um uh, a, a very uh, thorough dealing of with the topic of, of tantra um which I've, I've also read and you've you have a um website with all sorts of courses on it and i've done your foundations of tantra course which i highly recommend to everybody that's a free course um you do workshops in person i went to one of those in london i'm a bit of a fanboy by the sounds of listing all of these things you have a, a facebook page uh called tantric yoga now which i frequent and find that really really helpful and um, there's a great community of people on there and you have tons and tons of youtube videos um which uh i've watched a lot of so i I think one of the great things i just want to let the audience know uh, about 
your work is there's loads of it on the internet um really accessible um and uh at the end we'll 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 say what the website is and i know that's the kind of your yeah. learning portal hub where it all all the tentacles end up in that body of the yeah. octopus so to speak um yeah. and your your latest book uh called near enemies uh of the truth where do we have the actual title of it oh i just deleted it oh no here we go near enemies of the truth avoid the pitfalls of the spiritual path and become radically free uh, which i've just finished reading and i absolutely love um and that's what we were going to be discussing today um oh, so there oh. we go it's a little uh, little intro um i'm glad you mentioned the recognition mm -hmm. sutras because um you know tantra illuminated which is sort of a textbook I think a, a fun and accessible textbook, but still a kind of uh, uh, a comprehensive textbook introduction to the tantric tradition. So it sells much better. It's much more popular, but the recognition sutras goes deeper into the teachings of non-dual tantra. And, uh, you know, the people I highly respect like Rupert Spira and um, uh, Michael Taft, they also say it's their favorite uh, spiritual text these days. And so I, I think it takes a bit of maturity. That's a compliment to you, right? A bit of spiritual maturity to um, appreciate it more <laughs> than Tantra Illuminated, which is, again, the more famous work. Um, and then, of course, Near Enemies of the Truth is a very different kind of thing. And because that's aimed at a much, much wider audience um and it's addressing kind of spiritual cliches that that uh, are are very prevalent in all sorts of uh, spiritual communities whereas the recognition sutras as as great as that text is is a, is a deep dive that that can seem esoteric or or difficult to people who aren't already familiar with uh the philosophies of non-dual tantra so uh, just just for your listeners to kind of sketch out uh, the differences uh, of those of those three books and i'll just mention um there's many more books coming hopefully seven more <laughs> in this lifetime uh <laughs> if i manage it but yeah um happy to talk about near enemies cuz that's the newest book and it's already a bit controversial <laughs> meaning to say there's a lot of people saying, um, on the one hand, oh, this is great spiritual myth busting, and you know, it's it's helping bring clarity to a field of 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 confusion and and woolly thinking. Uh, and then, of course, there's others who are like, you know, that their favorite myth got busted in the book, and they just think it's wrong, and they post negative reviews and you know i'm sure people will see if they look the reviews are kind of polarized it's either five star or one star you know it's not in it's not just a a, a book that kind of trashes stuff it's uh there's a there's a, a good new word i've heard called the critosphere and it's a kind of and it's kind of a, a flavor of a particular type of internet culture where people just tear things down and you know, mm. criticize things, but they don't offer they don't offer anything in return. Um, mm. And this this book, uh, you know, leans very very hard on uh, some of these misconceptions um, because they're incredibly important. But it it doesn't just leave you in a pile of rubble. Um, it, you you actually offer people uh, the actual profound truth that is actually the 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 essence of of that particular inquiry and also some practices that people can do. Yeah, exactly. I, I try to. Um, that's really the point of the book, you know, to to criticize or critique. I like that word better. Um, some of these misunderstood spiritual cliches and platitudes that sort of draws in the reader who felt, yeah, there's something not quite right about these platitudes. But then the real point of the book is to say, well, but also there's a deeper truth that's uh, 
adjacent to uh, the, the the platitude or, or almost captured but not quite <laughs> by by that cliche um, and that's really the point of it is to is to investigate the deeper truths that are only hinted at by these uh, everyday spiritual cliches uh, and and to also offer some practices as you said guided meditations and contemplations and that's the part that for the actual practitioner as opposed to the person who you know just likes to read read a book that allows them to look down on others <laughs> you know for the actual practitioner it's it's those contemplations and meditations that, that, that the book is really all about and can i ask you ralph uh, what what was your favorite part of the book whether it's a chapter or whether it's rather an aspect or or an approach that you found mm. in the book what what struck you the most personally in it well i'd say uh my favorite thing about it was that it it makes what you've written about in the recognition sutras and tantra illuminated really accessible so, so i kind of imagine uh if you imagine a funnel towards the recognition sutras, um, you know, you might, a listener who'd never come across your work, I mean, I might make, recommend they start with Near Enemies of the Truth, then mm -hmm. work, then read Tantra Illuminated, and then the recognition sutras. Because um, I, what I was really enjoying was how the, I think we should, we should, if, if you could define non-dual Tantra quickly for listeners mm. as well. Mm. Um, but the, the view, the philosophy of non-dual tantra is, is really clearly presented mm. um, in this book in in a, in a really accessible way. Um, so I think there's there's always a, a throat clearing, well, not always a throat clearing, but there's sometimes a throat clearing one has to do when talking about tantra these days that we're not talking about neo tantra, and perhaps you could mm. just define what we're talking about in, in terms of yeah, tantra. yeah. And and first I'll say that the new book, Near Enemies of the Truth, it it draws upon non-dual tantra, but it really seeks to highlight those teachings of, of that tradition that are also found in some other traditions, other non-dual spiritual traditions. So there's a lot of overlap, of course, uh, with any non-dual tradition with any other and also not meaning to say non-dual tantra has unique teachings that are not found in other traditions and it has lots of teachings that are also found in other traditions and with with the book uh you know i'm trying to be helpful to those on any spiritual path at all and that's what's important it's not sectarian at all as you know, it's it's just really trying to provide helpful guidance to someone on any spiritual path, even though, of course, some of the specific insights are sometimes drawn from non-dual tantra, um, which sometimes just explicates themes in the spiritual life more clearly and precisely, but they're the same themes that we find in spiritual paths worldwide. Um, but to answer your question, just a bit about what is uh, non-dual tantra, well, to give uh, the, the full name of the tradition I study, it's non-dual Shaiva tantra, meaning to say it's the version of tantra that flourished in the religion of Shiva and Shakti, which is distinct from but very closely related to uh, the version of tantra that flourished in Buddhism. So a lot of people are familiar to uh, some degree with Tibetan Buddhism. At least everybody's heard of the Dalai Lama. But a lot of people don't realize that Tibetan Buddhism is tantric Buddhism, that it's thoroughly tantric. Um, but it's a particular version of tantra. It's a Buddhist version, of course, but it's also a Tibetan version. And it's also a monastic version, that is to say the version of Tantra taught and practiced by people who are primarily Buddhist monks in the Tibetan tradition. So that gives it slightly different flavor. However, not as different as one might think. If one looks at the specific practices, if you're drilling down into the nitty gritty, as it were, um, 
and looking at the specific practices of Tibetan Buddhism, they are largely extremely similar, at least structurally in terms of form rather than content. They're extremely similar to the practices in every other tantric tradition, uh, Shaiva Tantra and, and Vaishnava Tantra, the, the tantric tradition related to um, the deity Vishnu or Krishna. These are all very similar in terms of their form and structure and different in terms of their content, uh, meaning to say the specific vi visualizations, the specific mantras, the specific deities being invoked. But the way in which they work with the subtle body, or also known as the energy body, that's very, very similar across these multiple tantric traditions, because tantra was originally a spiritual movement that propagated through all the religions that existed in the Indian subcontinent at the time that the movement was happening, which is roughly the 6th century up through the 12th century, and it continued to be influential for, for several centuries after that as well. I'm just citing the classical period of Tantra. So uh, non-dual Tantra is the version of Tantra that teaches a non-duality of consciousness, meaning to say it teaches a, a, a doctrine which can be realized experientially that consciousness is everything and everything is consciousness. So it's non-dual in the sense that there is nothing but consciousness. But why use the phrase, or the word non-dual, as opposed to the word oneness or monism, right? It's because there appear to be two. There very much appear to be two things in experience, namely consciousness and its contents. Or we could say awareness and what you are aware of. For most people, even somewhat experienced meditators, they, those appear to be distinct. They appear to be very much two. Uh, and this is the tradition or one of the traditions that teaches, no, in fact, when you look deeper and deeper through your meditative practice, because uh, you don't arrive at this, of course, by thinking about it, <laughs> but through meditative practice, you can realize that consciousness manifests as its contents uh that 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 all the substance of 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 what you are aware of is made of nothing but awareness um so that is what makes it non-dual of course um and it, it, so non-dual tantra then is a system of practice because the word tantra literally means system or a system of practice. Um, and it's a system of practice aimed at whatever version of the goal is being articulated in, in, in some specific lineage, because it's a lineage based uh, tradition, meaning to say different lineages have different versions of the goal of practice. And some are, are more dualistic that seek a kind of transcendence of everyday life, a transcendence of the world uh, and the body and the senses. And others are this, such as this non-dual kind I'm talking about, they don't seek a, a transcendence. Well, it's said that one must have the transcendent experience of the absolute, but then the goal is to integrate that transcendent experience of the absolute with every nuance of everyday life to realize the transcendent absolute in and as the substance of everyday experience and so again that's what that's what makes it uh, non-dual so it's a system of practice aimed at a goal in this case uh, non-dual realization and so as a as a non-dual system of practice, it entails everything <laughs> in life that, that can be leveraged toward this realization. So that is to say, um, there's, there's nothing that's excluded. So in some religions, of course, uh, sexuality, for example, is excluded from religious practice. It's something sinful. It's something distinct from religious practice. 
and and for that matter, everyday activities like you know eating or going for a walk, they're not religious practice. And in non-dual tantra, anything can be a religious practice when done with uh, awareness, mindfulness, and the cultivation of non-dual insight. So, uh, therefore, everything's included, and and one can. Uh, explore one's sexuality as a non-dual spiritual practice. One can explore one's relationship to food and eating as a non-dual practice. Um, and this is what led to the widespread misunderstanding of the word Tantra. Now, this mis misunderstanding is already a hundred years old, so it's extremely entrenched. It, 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 this misunderstanding has been propagated in the West for such a long time through generations um, that, that, that Tantra is specifically about sex or sexuality. And indeed, what we call Neo-Tantra is, that is to say, this, this Western invention, which can be perfectly beneficial for some people, um, but it's n not really related to the original tantric tradition because uh, Western neo-tantra uh, came about on the basis of hearsay, just hearing about <laughs> that there was this spiritual practice that somehow involves sexuality. So uh, that's that's quite a long story. A lot of academics have written about that. But long story short, <laughs> the, the, the Western... Um, what we call Neo Tantra, which is exactly what is taught in any workshop that advertises tantric sex, any book, any workshop, any online webinar that ha uses the phrase tantric sex is, is actually drawing on this Western 100 year old tradition that has virtually no connection with the Indian tradition of the same name. So that exactly is, is the confusion. And when we look at the um, sexual practices that are given in the original tantric tradition, they bear almost zero similarity to the sexual practices taught in, in modern neo-tantra under the name of, of tantric sex. So therefore, it, unfortunately, it isn't the case that if you go to a tantric sex workshop, you're at least getting a little taste of what of what the original tradition offered on this subject usually you're not there there's some rare exceptions there's some teachers of neo tantra that have gone on to study classical tantra and try to integrate the two but these are few and far between um so that i hope <laughs> clears up the, yeah. the the confusion <clears throat> on that point it's uh my my uh kind of tongue-in-cheek publicity stunt uh, that I'm not really going to do this, but if I, I put in the title of this uh, YouTube video we're doing now, um, Tantric Master Has Sex for 12 Hours, You Won't Believe What Happens Next. Uh, I can guarantee a million views, but um, yeah, that's my own joke. <laughs> yeah, but then <laughs> they'll they'll rapidly discover that's nothing but... Uh, I know, I know, that's right. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's important for you to have said what you've just said, um, because the the theme of non-dual tantra it's the kind of the soil out of which this book near enemies of the truth has grown because you are a tantric scholar and practitioner mm. um and it obviously that word comes up a lot uh in the book um and i think the so one of the th um the things that would be would be good to do is to talk about what an, a near enemy is um and i think there's a there's a good quote here i'm just going to pull out from your your mm -hmm. book you say when we're talking about deep and fundamental truths getting it a little bit wrong doesn't much matter in the short term but it very much matters in the long term just like a tiny adjustment to the rudder of your boat makes little difference at first but after 2000 miles, it lands you on a different continent. And that's the kind of bullseye of, you know, what this inquiry, the, the importance of this inquiry is. So if you could please just define 
what you mean by a near enemy of the truth. I think that would be really helpful for people listening to this. Yeah. Well, first, uh, let me talk about truth a little bit, because that itself is a, a, a naughty concept. Um, and indeed, <laughs> it's difficult to um, talk about in words, because, of course, real truth, deep truth, is ineffable, meaning to say it can't be said in words, we can only approximate it in words. And so a lot of people have the idea, you know, that through spiritual practice or through mystical experience, it's possible to have a direct revelation of truth, which is um, unmediated by psychology or culture, um, you know, uninfluenced by any of those factors, it's absolutely pure. But in fact, this is very, very difficult, possible, I grant, but extremely rare, because when people engage in spiritual practice or inquiry or contemplation of any kind, they are bringing to that endeavor uh, all kinds of cultural programming and assumptions. And a, a lot of this cultural programming, of course, has the guise of spirituality and spiritual philosophy. But still, whatever you've absorbed in terms of words uh, and concepts, that constitutes a prior bias. And in spirituality, just as much as anywhere else, um, confirmation bias is, is very much a thing. So you can have... Um, what seems to be a, a revelation or an epiphany, but uh, it's nearly always very much influenced by uh, the mental baggage that you're bringing into the practice that then uh, 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 yields that very epiphany. So the only way uh, uh, around this conundrum is to engage in a systematic process of deconstruction. And the deconstruction that I allude to is one in which you strip away narratives and concepts from experience relentlessly over the course of years of practice uh, until, you're, in, until you're experiencing without concepts and without narratives. Some people think that's impossible, but it is possible. It just takes a lot of work. And of course, that means not applying any labels because even a one word label is already a narrative. If you're experiencing a, a, a heat or intensity energy in your body and you call it anger, that's already a narrative. If you call this experience of heat, intensity and energy in the body anger, uh, it's because there's already a story in play in your mind about why you're experiencing this. And without that story, there is no anger. There's just the raw intensity or, or, or heat or energy. And that goes for all the other emotions too. So I just mentioned this to illustrate that there can be narratives that, that consist only of one word, and yet they are still narratives and bring with them all the baggage associated with that word. So this deconstruction process uh, that I'm talking about has to go very deep for it to be truly effective. We, we have to see that even the notion, I am a man, I am a woman, I am, I am a person, has to be stripped away, that that is a narrative that influences um, the frames that we put on experience. So if you go through this process, as, as I have myself and, and uh, many others have, and let me tell you, it's quite grueling at times. <laughs> it's not the pleasant version of spirituality, but we go through this grueling process because the, the, in the end, there is an incredible bliss and joy and wonder of aliveness, which is not available in its fullness without going through the deconstruction process. Now, why why get into all this in this moment? Precisely because you can't say anything about how well or how badly words approximate truth if you're not experiencing truth. 
And for that, the deconstruction process is needed. Now, um, some listeners are going to say like, wait a second, this guy claims to be experiencing real truth. Is there even such a thing? And if there is, uh, how can he claim to experience? Well, okay, first of all, there is such a thing. It's just, again, ineffable. It's non-conceptual. It's that which we all share in common without most of us are even realizing that we do. And to, to claim to experience truth is not such an extraordinary claim. In fact, there are many, many, many people, who knows how many, but certainly worldwide, uh, at a guess, certainly hundreds of thousands of people who have gone through this process that I'm talking about. And many of them have gone through the process without um, attaching a word to it which can which can so easily um cause it to to go off the rails a word such as enlightenment uh and and i talk about that in the book a bit um but we'll definitely so, get into that later <laughs> yeah so so to to, to bring it full, full circle here um that to be intimate with reality is a possibility for every human being. I'm not claiming to be some extraordinary Buddha. Anyone who devotes uh, some years of their life in which this is the top priority can uh, verify what I'm talking about, that there is such a thing as wordless, non-conceptual truth shared in common by all conscious beings that most of them just overlook because they are so caught up in their concepts and then once we're sensing that and and it's not to say that any one person could could sense it from all possible angles of perception because even though there's uh one truth one could say fundamentally um it can be sensed from sort of many possible angles all of them non-conceptual and any one person can't can't sense all the angles OK, but even sensing some of them, you can then see uh, there, there's something magical that happens. Really, you can read anything from the words of Jesus or the words attributed to Jesus in the Bible or other religious texts and see, oh, wow, you, you sense what they are approximating and, and, and you sense how they how they were distorted over time, you know, but you but you sense where they were coming from. And that's the important thing, because uh, the, the exact words uh, can't capture it, but they're coming from somewhere that is very, very real. OK, so a near a near enemy of the truth in this context is a, a teaching or phrase or saying or or or, or platitude that approximates a deep truth, but it doesn't approximate it skillfully enough to be effective in the long term, as the quote you mentioned points out. It it might approximate it skillfully enough to be effective in the short term, especially for beginners, right? So people come to the spiritual path and they hear about, um, you know, be in the present moment or follow your bliss or or you create your own reality um, or everything happens for a reason. And these sayings can be super effective in the beginning because they provide a different kind of orientation from our, our mainstream consumerist culture. And that, and that initial orientation is effective. I'm not saying it's not, it's effective for many, many, many people. But um, any any single phrase, you know, kind of bumper sticker phrase or 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 easy to to uh, say platitude is not going to approximate the truth well enough to be sustainable in the long term. So then we need to look deeper and inquire into what is um, what is this attempting to approximate that it's actually much more more nuanced. So the book is a, is a is a reworking of the concept of near enemies of the truth because in everyday uh, Buddhism 
the the phrase near enemy of the truth is used in a quite simple way, such as the following. The near enemy of compassion is pity. The near enemy of love is attachment, and so on. So in, in those um, sayings, which are very valuable sayings, by the way, and I agree with them, but in those sayings, it's, it's relatively simple. You're just saying, okay, compassion, as we define it, and there needs to be, of course, a definition, is something much more powerful and impactful and relevant than pity, which can look like compassion. And indeed, pity could even be called compassion by someone who doesn't yet have developed and mature understanding, just as attachment could easily be called love by someone who doesn't yet have mature and developed understanding. But uh, the contrast is, is, is a single word, even though those words, of course, need to be defined by the teacher who is using them. Whereas in the book, I'm saying that um, the truth to which these phrases are merely near enemies um, that is not going to be articulatable in a single phrase. So I don't, what I don't do in the book is say, uh, okay, um, you know, you create your own reality is the near enemy of blank and fill in the blank with a simple expression that, that the former one is the near enemy of, because these particular near enemies are, um, the truths to which they're adjacent, <laughs> are sufficiently nuanced and subtle that you cannot sum them up in a single phrase. And that means the, the reader has to do a bit of work, namely reading the book, right? Because, because wouldn't it be easy? <laughs> I wouldn't even have, have had to write a book. You know, I could just give a few talks on, uh, oh, no, no, this is the near enemy of that. And if that was easily articulatable. Um, but if you're interested in, in mature spirituality um, and an ever evolving spirituality to reference the name of your podcast, that, that you need to be willing to go beyond that, which um, can become a sound bite, right? If, if it, it, you can use sound bites in your head to remember a more complex teaching that's the original purpose of a sutra in the tradition. It's a soundbite that helps you remember a more nuanced teaching. But you cannot be satisfied with the soundbite if you want real mature spirituality. So going into the nuance and realizing, oh, there's I, I can't just hang on to a mental phrase, a mental image, a, a, a simple takeaway. And that's, of course... It, the problem, if I'm going to get on this hobby horse, with modern culture, uh, modern internet culture, YouTube culture, etc., is that um, people want, what's the takeaway? What's the simple, easy to remember takeaway? Now, there may be such takeaways, you know, in the realm of health and care for the body, you know, it's like, get sunlight in your eyes first thing in the morning, exercise 30 minutes a day, you know, these are perfectly accurate takeaways that that are helpful to people but when it comes to spirituality which by definition is ultimately a non-conceptual thing there cannot be simple easy one phrase takeaways um except in the sense of mnemonics uh, to 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 a much much deeper subtler contemplation and and that's that's the challenge that's why spirituality cannot be packaged into <laughs> Uh, bite-sized chunks easily and and that it is not disseminated in social media very effectively um and of course i myself put little quotes on social media on instagram or whatever but those quotes are actually serving as reminders to people who've received a deeper deeper teaching I, I I am under no illusion that <laughs> somebody could just read the quote on an Instagram meme and and experience some real insight or or enlightenment from that. Mm. Well, yeah, I, again, uh, very very important things you said, and so behind, so I think what can confuse people sometimes is you get these very pithy. Sometimes in in. Uh, when you're using mantras and things, it can be a single syllable that it, in a kind of 
the idea of chunking you've got that or or a pyramid you've got an enormous amount of nuanced philosophy and practice thousands of years of people practicing recording and this whole project um you know you could sum up in if you're thinking of non-dual tantra for example in the the mantra om which i one translation you offered a while back was that it om means yes and i love uh, the way you said it was it's yes <laughs> for me uh that 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 it can encapsulate decades of really hard graft for me i hear that and it reminds me of it brings together decades of hard work and um yeah. you know uh <clears throat> so there there is a there is a, a place for all of that as as you say um but it it's pe it, and i i think we being internet literate is as important for people into spirit in spirituality as anybody else using social media not getting scammed uh you're it's like you're playing chess against the algorithms you're playing you're working against on the internet are like grand chess grandmasters and you're like some noob on a chessboard and you know all of this is really important and i think which is one of the reasons why this book is so important now um and there, there's a podcast i've been listening to a lot recently and I, and I hope to interview um them it's called con spirituality um and although i don't agree with with all of it and I, honestly i find uh, them a little bit politically partisan but um i listen to that podcast all the time but for the very reason that it sometimes pisses me off and it's like those are the air, you know, it's really important to pour some of this acid on your own sacred cows uh, or mm. idols, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, I know, I know those guys, by the way, I know that mm. I know the spirituality guys, and I, I know a couple of them fairly well. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's a good po podcast most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in your book you've got 17 near enemies and as you say each one of these is in incredibly nuanced uh i originally encountered this material of yours via your youtube video so you did like an hour-long youtube video on each one of these that became the book and you've got an entire chapter on all of these ones and um it's a large book so really people ought to read the book to to get the the, the full unpacking of all of these um there were a few that i wanted to just uh, open up a little bit with you if that's that's okay mm -hmm. and i think what, what i do i'll just quickly list all 17 just so people have got an idea of you know the kind of what we're talking about here so you've got follow your bliss speak your truth be your best self be in the moment listen to your heart love yourself everything happens for a reason everything happens for the best find your soul's purpose you create your own reality you can choose how to respond negative energy and negative emotions energy healing i am my own guru the universe has given me a sign and go with the flow and then you've got a whole another section part two you call finding deeper currents where you talk about these concepts uh, reality, enlightenment, ego, non-duality, and surrender. So it's, it's so much rich ground there. Um, but I think if I just open up one or two of them for a bit of discussion, I think for those, for people that perhaps regularly listen to this podcast, these might be of particular interest to them and they're in, of interest to me. And so if we look at uh, be your best self, um, and I'll just uh, start with a quote that you, you have here. So this is quoting from your book. We imagine the possibility that we could at some point in the future consistently be as good and kind and loving as we were on our best day ever. Then we call these imagined possibilities our potential or our best self. But you see the problem. 
If you think this way, you are creating a situation in which you almost constantly fail to live up to how you think you should be, necessitating some version of self-hatred as a result. Ironically, believing that you are not as you should be drains you of the very life energy that would otherwise allow you to contribute to the world. So this sounded very familiar to me. And a, a one thing I will say about all of these near enemies of the truth here, all of these have uh, affected me at some point in the past and will do in the future. Um, and I think it's important to lay that out there because it's <laughs> like, uh, you know, yeah. So it, how this relates to experiences I've had. So I, uh, uh, psychedelics has been quite a large part of my journey, but you can probably tell by the backdrop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the things that happens with the use of psychedelics is you experience these absolutely sublime states. Um, I mean, if I, t if I took one as an example, I mean, this isn't necessarily psychedelic, but if we if MDMA, you experienced love. So the first time I took MDMA, I experienced love like I'd never experienced it before. It was absolutely, well, you, people know what everyone talks about, about MDMA. Mm. It, it, and then once it wears off, suddenly you're back to where you were and you've had this, you know what you've experienced to going back to your quote on your very best mm. day ever. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, I want that all the time because you, you know how good it is. And if you, you can relate this to uh, deep state meditation practice, some uh, sublime Kundalini um, experience, those kind of things. And then you you start comparing your everyday experience of life to that, and things can become seem very flat. Normal relationships can seem flat. You you can end up thinking, "What's wrong with me? Why can't I be like that all the time?" So um, <clears throat> that was something that when I read that chapter, that was something that came up for me uh, as a, as an experience that over decades of experience with different psychedelics um i've kind of come to terms with that more i've got an understanding of it. that's the nuance that happens with practice um but that was one of the things that that i that came up for me uh the states of consciousness non-ordinary extraordinary states of consciousness versus your everyday reality experience and uh, and uh, that feeds into another near enemy of the truth that you deal with later which is i can't remember which one it is but basically that the one being who we all are is actually perfectly at home with this moment just as it is and um yeah yeah you know when i when i first tried mdma myself um, I had a slightly different experience. I was like, wow, thank God I have a meditation practice because otherwise I'd get addicted to this drug, mm. right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the expansive open-hearted feeling was familiar to me, uh, as, as, as a side effect of, of meditation. And, um, you know, that, 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 what now mdma can have a number of different effects of course we should know like <laughs> for those who have um ptsd it can activate the trauma and in in a way that allows for healing if a skilled professional is facilitating right so uh, for some people they take mdma and they they experience their trauma they experience fear you know they experience uh, um all sorts of things so it's not a simple thing like people who haven't taken it imagine oh you take a pill and you just feel happy it's not that simple at all uh it, you know it takes us into our our um emotional core but it also gives us access to um something deeper than the emotional core and that is ideally for for the right person 
um, who, who takes it, they experience this incredibly profound okayness. Everything is okay, actually. I'm okay, just as I am. And everything is. And so, again, on a, on a good MDMA experience or ideal one, um, you touch into that. And what I would argue is that that is actually um, tasting or experiencing or touching into our deepest nature. That is to say, our deepest nature as conscious beings includes as an intrinsic part of it, um, what the tantric tradition calls ananda. And ananda, of course, is just often translated as bliss, um, but it's actually something uh, deeper and more interesting than bliss, at least in the tantric understanding. It's this um, profound sense of, of okayness or beauty or, or gratitude in that's possible in any life circumstance. So ananda is, at least again, in the tantric sense of the word, it's completely untranslatable because it might not feel like bliss at all. It might just feel like um, a, a deep loving acceptance of pain, the ability to see the beauty in pain, to see how it helps you be more compassionate and open to others and connect with others. You know, if, if you realize how pain can be a force for human connection and compassion, then you see the beauty in it. And I'm not talking, of course, conceptually, I'm not talking about understanding this with your mind, but having a direct, very visceral experience of it, it that's very, very, very different, right? So Ananda kind of covers all this, this ground. Um, and so if, if MDMA introduces people to this Ananda, great. But the, 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 the point from my perspective and the perspective of many other meditation teachers uh, I know is to convince people, oh, what you've been introduced to is actually intrinsic to your true nature it's not just a product of of the drug yes of course the drug has its own kind of neurological effects like you know you're getting an all over body high or tingle that's that's just the drug right but it, it can also give you access to um something which is intrinsic in your true nature and so through meditative practice if we access this deeper and deeper without the drug, um, then it is possible, and, and I speak from experience, but there's many other people who testify to this, that it's possible to feel this pro profound sense of okayness, even blessedness in the midst of a very challenging circumstance that, 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 that elicits profound grief, for example. And that's a very different experience you know if if you have a if you have a tragic um incident in your life that elicits deep grief and you don't have this connection to the profound okayness at the core of our being then it can feel like at worst it can feel like you know god hates you it's like or or the universe is a cold unfeeling unfriendly place um and 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 there you know, that's a terrible, terrible feeling. And it, it turns out it's wrong, but it's a very convincing feeling when you don't have access to this this deep, for lack of a better word, <laughs> okayness that again is intrinsic to our true nature. So it's interesting that there's an actual argument here in the philosophical sense of the word argument <laughs> that the tradition wants to say, actually it is intrinsic. It's not just... Um, an unpredictable epiphenomenon. No, it's this ananda is intrinsic to our true nature and a, a sufficiently deep spiritual practice can prove that for absolutely anyone. And of course, it's going to be harder for some than others to, to come to the direct visceral actualization of that promise. Um but it's a, a it's a startling promise, and I hope some listeners take it serious seriously if they haven't already. 
Um, and it's and it really is so different from the feel good that you get from believing nice things, right? Uh, it, it's it's something so much deeper than that. Um, so in, that's why you know psychedelics are very much not irrelevant. Now, of course, as you said, MDMA it's not a classical psychedelic, um, but it is a, a psychoactive uh, thing. But that and and classical psychedelics can give us access to something very, very, very real and foundational in the nature of consciousness. But the problem is those psychedelics also come with sort of bells and whistles, you know, like hallucinations or body highs or or artifacts of uh, the, the, the specific drug that could easily be confused with what is being revealed, meaning to say, um, somebody might get the wrong idea that spiritual experience, when it's authentic, is extremely intense or extremely sensual, or um, it's an altered state, you know, uh, it, and those are actually the artifacts of the drugs that you can have the same fundamental spiritual experience without these alterations in in, in perception, for example, Um but if you if you haven't had them through meditation, then then usually you don't know the difference, and and therefore psychedelic users tend to fetishize extraordinary experience when actually the experience of our true nature is deeply. Well, I almost said ordinary. It's not ordinary. It's extraordinary, but in a very very sweetly simple way. It's of course not capturable in words, but it's not an altered state, right? Yeah. It's going it's going deeper into the pure beingness that we sensed even as little children, but 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 didn't appreciate the fullness of. I, I think we we do experience that or recognize it more in formal meditation sitting meditation practice because there's less distractions from from this and uh, and I've been meditating for for decades too, uh, and it's taken me a long time to consistently recognize the radically radically open nature of my essence. When I say my, I mm. don't necessarily mean our person, essence, but yeah, yeah, our essence, <laughs> my our it's all they all kind of collapse into one but um and i i it is a different type of ex, uh recognition um thing than psychedelic states i'd say in in my experience it's more like the big kahuna it's the, the un, undoing what they call the ahamkara the 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 eye maker or the not at the heart of yourself, the kind of central contraction, Re rec uh, knowing that that is actually always undone and actually feeling that in your own, the, the, the core of your own self, that's the kind of, in, having done a lot of all of these sort of things, in my opinion is, is the, 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 the one worth focusing on most in your life because uh, one's life um it's the kind of root of all of these other things really I, it's or maybe that's not quite the right word but if you're going to do one thing that would would be my recommendation for one thing to to focus on in one's life um the one thing being being untying the un knot untying the the and recognizing one's own essential nature, essence nature, as, as, as yeah. you put it. Um, it and um, there's a lot of distractions that can keep get you off off that course. But um, some of these things point the way. But I, um, it, you know, there's so much more we could say about about that. Um, w one of the things that you s have hint at in this particular near enemy military be your best self and i've heard you mention other times is that 
cultural evolution and the evolution of consciousness is kind of a bullshit con concept. Um, and I might be misinterpreting what you're saying. Um, but I, I was very influenced at a certain point, you know, quite a few years ago by the work of developmental psychology, um, the work of Ken Wilber, <clears throat> these kind of things. And if on a personal level, children clearly develop through psychological and emotional cognitive stages as they grow and we're kind of in the modern west we think that that stops once you hit 18 or 21 but it, it doesn't have to i think um, my own view is that one can keep on growing through one's life and there are people that like ken wilbur who have kind of mapped that a similar kind of developmental trajectory onto culture um, and this is tends to be the more uh, controversial aspect of it I think the developmental psychology is quite a well um, uh, it, there's been lots of experiments done in that over a long it's quite a rigorous uh, topic well established well established yeah um, but I think one of the ways that the simple ways people talk about the cultural evolution is is so in in kind of lines of moral development and how on mass humans have more rights now than they used to in thousands of thousands of years ago or something on mass and that because tribes were more splintered and interacted with each other less there was kind of more it's you was kind of surrounded a bit more with with enemies when then with the development of city states large groups of people came together and those kind of yeah. things and so i mean it it it's it is a it's a very very big topic quite a subtle one um and there's lots of crit uh, people that critique it and i i i don't think uh people were obviously very intelligent in the past and intelligence is very specific um, to the world you live in and people have to just deal with different things than they used to in the past but do you see some developmental trajectory in culture in terms of morality say and I mean I, I know we loads of we could talk about wars and uh, <laughs> all of these kind of things, but well, yeah. So mm. the interesting thing is, uh, <laughs> we we don't have anywhere near enough data mm. to to come to such conclusions. These mm. are extremely premature conclusions, given that, um, you know, as as um, Tim Urban put it, if the entire history of humanity, you know, since we had language, uh, the very beginning of language, if the entire history of humanity was a thousand page book, then everything that's happened in the last 100 years is the final page of that thousand page book. And, and, and already on the second to last page, of that book we've got you know the american civil war and just a, a couple of pages back we've got the medieval period um which was obviously profoundly unenlightened from our perspective so there's no way there's absolutely no way to say that this is anything but um an aberration right like the, some good ideas somehow managed to get centered in some cultures, uh, right? And those good ideas, like the civil society, you know, like the public square, like 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 civil discourse, like um, uh, you know, and there's we could talk about many more, but did they get centered because humans are getting innately more? developed or innately more moral i would suspect not i would suspect that those good ideas got centered 
primarily for economic reasons and, and reasons of political stability. People like political stability because then economies can flourish. And it so happens that some of these very good ideas, which are independently good, I, I would say, they happen to get centered for reasons of, of political and economic expediency. And sometimes, of course, those are not the primary values in some Islamic societies today that, that, that center the doctrine of jihad, that overrides political stability as a value. It overrides economic flourishing as a value. Um, and so therefore they don't uh, experience the same civil society, uh, you know, and you've got situations like, you know, in Yemen, for example, you know, which has been an absolute humanitarian catastrophe, which has been um, barely registered in Western media compared to, for example, the war in Gaza right now, which uh, captures far more headlines than the much worse humanitarian catastrophe because it appeals to um, human instincts of tribalism. We've got the, the mostly white folks on one side and the mostly brown folks on another side. So that's tribalism. So that captures people's interest. Whereas um, in Yemen, it's been Arab versus Arab, and that doesn't capture people's in interest in the same way. And that is really, really disturbing. It should be disturbing to any thinking person that it's not the scale of the humanitarian catastrophe that matters at all, but rather whether the um, antagonists are two different colors, you know, that speaks to our base tribalistic instincts, then it captures our attention. That is uh, deeply disturbing to any, to any reasonable thinking person. And that I could go on and on about why mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's no specific reason. We don't have good reasons to suspect that humankind has evolved uh, uh, moralistically speaking or intellectually. Obviously, we have a rise of populism now. We have the rise of right wing dictators uh, now in many countries or would be dictators, <laughs> you know, people people like Trump who would love to be right-wing dictators, but they just didn't quite manage it, um, uh, though it could still happen, um, God forbid. But <laughs> the point is that this rise of populism uh, and, and, and right-wing dictators should make reasonable people second guess and question their assumptions that, um, you know, cultural evolution is really definitely a thing. Now, whether it could be a thing in a longer term scenario, absolutely it could. You know, it, it, human beings given enough time, if we don't kill ourselves off, we could realize what contributes to human flourishing consistently and what doesn't. We could manage to sort ourselves out uh, and there could be cultural evolution, but I think the time scale is gonna be much, 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 much bigger than uh, people were were imagining, right? And and the the current events of the day are are exactly the evidence of that. Um, so that's one issue, <laughs> right? And and in terms of developmental psychology, um, well, it seems to me that the majority of humans stall, right? Meaning to say they do develop. Of course they develop, but um, most adults are still overgrown adolescents. The thing is that, that that fact is concealed by the development of, of superficial social norms, meaning to say most adults can behave politely. But under the surface, um, most people are still emotionally adolescent. And their spouses know this, you know, and 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 so their other family members know this, right? If they bother to, of course, some some people just repress it relentlessly. But if they but if they do express some of their true uh, uh, feelings and thoughts, um, you know, then their spouses know how exactly how adolescent they can be, and. Uh, you know, I, I include myself in this in this criticism 
up until at least um, not all that long ago. The, see, the thing is, our society and, and 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 our culture doesn't give us the tools to successfully mature out of adolescence. We have to find our way with it, and and if we do find our way with it, we find our way um, over the course of of a couple of decades. But in a truly mature, truly sane society, people would be given the tools to mature beyond um, uh, an emotionally adolescent mentality um, by the age of you know, 24, 25. That is to say, for example, developing an ego, well, that's a normal part of, of uh, development, right? But then people are just stuck with it for the rest of their lives, usually. Most people go to their graves with this... Um, utterly intractable ego you know which 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 almost entirely lacks the power of self reflection and blames everyone else for for how you life didn't go the way it should have done and you know that's more the common that that's more the the norm than the exception unfortunately right but in in this imagined hypothetical <laughs> truly sane society we you, you develop an ego in adolescence and then you transcend it in your 20s, right? Because the ego has served its purpose and, it, and it's no longer needed. Um, and, and, and you ch achieve true adulthood in your 20s, which most people never do. Um, now, if you're lucky, <laughs> like, like myself and, 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 and possibly some listeners, um, you manage to achieve true adulthood eventually, in your 40s, in your 50s, but you got to keep working on it. That's the thing. It's like it's like being in school. Like you said, you can keep growing in your life, depending on what you mean by growth. But you have to be committed to something like being in school nonstop, right? You got to work at it, mm. and then um, then you 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 might manage to see that all your self images are, are 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 nothing but mind stuff they're just a bunch of thoughts they're not worth defending they're not wor worth um you know uh, trying to prove oneself to others that oh i'm no i'm really a good person and you misunderstood me and like you know we waste a huge amount of time in defending our self images rather than connecting with the humans that we love they're upset about something we did and we go immediately into self-defense and that's the ego and if you find yourself going into self-defense no matter what age you are you still have an adolescent ego as most people do so i would prefer instead of um f uh, fantasy notions of evolution i would prefer a sober assessment of how immature we truly are as a species, um, and that that none of us can do anything about the species, but we can do something about ourselves, right? And so, if 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 enough of us prioritize that 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 maturation process, that difficult one, which involves yes, admitting um, how childish we can be even as adults, then maybe maybe that there's a chance for for um, species wide development not based on ideologies see this is the difference not based on just centering some good ideas that happen to create a more stable society but based on actual real development that's different from just believing certain thoughts you know i believe in capitalism i believe in individualism but rather developing organically you know then then it's possible but we would have to overcome as a species some huge challenges because we still have more than half the planet subject to religious ideologies which are taken to be literally true and which um, absolutely prevent any kind of inner work when when they are taken to be literally true mm. so sorry if that's a more <laughs> pessimistic view but but sobriety about the real challenges facing us that's the only way forward we can only st take real steps forward when we're when we're grounded in our real situation yeah by the way sorry mm. sorry for such long answers mm. but well, also you ask questions that that deserve long answers they can't be answered yeah. briefly yeah no I, I appreciate it and and that you know that should be uh, 
you know, uh, going thinking back to our earlier conversation about takeaways, you know, uh, to allow us to have one a takeaway from this conversation for those listening. These are all very, very nuanced and subtle things that are in this book, Near Enemies, um, and um, they re each one of them requires a lot of contemplation, conversation with people, reading the book. You know, it's so. So yeah, and and by the way, the book does ha have a chapter on ego and how ego is frequently misunderstood, right? Because these later chapters that you mentioned, reality and enlightenment and ego and so on, the argument there is that the popular understanding of these concepts is itself a near enemy to the more beneficial understanding. Like mm. that when people think they understand what ego means, what reality means, what enlightenment means, that understanding is nearly always a near enemy to the, the truth that that term could more usefully denote yeah well may, maybe if we uh I go on to this next one um well it's not next in the list in the way it comes into the book but this yeah. is kind of related to kind of what we were talking about giving giving people the best opportunities to have authentic an authentic spiritual life um and one that's not and ideologically bound um for example um you say here uh, in near enemy number 15 all paths lead to the same goal and then you have got this whole chapter about how that's a near enemy of the truth and that there's things uh you know wrong with that sentiment but it's kind of hinting at something um so my, you know my question with this is um whether a world spirituality so let's say looking very very long term you know uh, uh, cultures have been quite isolated historically uh up until more recent times and then possibly going forwards in the future becoming a more planetary species with with that at the forefront of people's minds and uh, cultures and uh, around the planet that I you know wonder about the possibility of some kind of world spirituality happening that's similar to uh, I don't know if you know about mixed martial arts um, sometimes referred to as cage fighting UFC ultimate fighting championships do you know about that yeah a, fr a, a good friend of mine um... Mark Jenko, he is a MMA fighter, and he actually wrote a book about the spirituality that can be experienced through MMA. That's yeah. called Inner Jiu Jitsu. That's his book. So if you're right. interested in that stuff, you might check it out. Well, I, so what I mean by that is for the whole history of humanity, we've had lots of different traditions of martial arts. You've had Kung Fu. Uh, wrestling you, you've got striking uh, tr traditions where you're punching kicking ones which are grappling ones kind of like wrestling um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu what happened with mixed martial arts it, the very first UFC competition in the early 90s they said well look, let's bring all of these people together and they can all fight and then we'll see who wins and it, it, it turned out that Brazilian jiu-jitsu was the master uh, skill at that time because if someone could take if a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, practitioner could take someone to the ground no matter how good they were at, at boxing and kicking um, they would win but then people learned how to deal with that and, you, and uh, to stop being taken down to the ground but the, the, the essence of what I'm speaking about is that now there's this new thing as, a, as a, arisen called mixed martial arts which outperforms any single traditional martial art form so if you put a, a boxer in a ring against a mixed martial arts fighter they will lose because they cut they haven't got a ground game where the when the the fight goes to the ground if you have someone who only is a wrestler um if the, if, if they get punched by someone who understands punching and kicking 
then doesn't matter how good they are at wrestling. You know, you know what I'm saying? So there's, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. there's this actual new art form, which has only been around since about 1990, called mixed martial arts, which yeah. actually outperforms any one single traditional art form. Yeah, so I see where you're going. You know, my, my question is, is that in a, in a nutshell, where we find ourselves now, we have shamanic traditions, Western psychology, the wisdom of the East. And, and I know wisdom of the East, that is uh, sure a, a ridiculously oversimplistic <laughs> okay. thing. And there's so many different traditions within the East that all say different things. But, you know, is there any value? I think this is this is probably what I'm asking. Is there any value in thinking or even trying to create so a planetary Dharma? So I don't know whether you know, what's his name? John Churchill. You come across him? No, no. no. So, you know, the planetary Dharma is what he calls it. Is, is that a yeah. fool's errand? Uh, you know, it's funny that you ask this question because only a few years ago, and, and for all of my life up until then, I would have said, yes, that's a fool's errand. Syncretism doesn't work in spirituality as much as new age type people want it to. It just doesn't. But now my answer is different, but it's a, it's a qualified answer. Um, so, I, you know, I used to be more sectarian, and so I was against uh, syncretism. And now I see that syncretism on the level of practice can be perfectly effective if it's grounded in an understanding of, of, of the path. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean. And I'm actually really glad you asked this question because it leads to a very, very important um, uh, discussion and, and an important possibility to put on the table, namely um, that there is one spiritual path dressed up in lots of different costumes uh that, that that we call you know sufism and tantra and christian mysticism and kabbalah and you know all, all sorts of different uh, names taoism and you know it, it doesn't there's so many different versions but what i mean when i say one spiritual path dressed up in different costumes is, is i mean to say that the spiritual path is actually the same fundamentally for all who walk it and they can walk it in the context of these um culturally different uh, uh religions or spiritualities right but um it's actually even more subtle than that <laughs> because it's more even more accurate rather than saying one spiritual path in different costumes it's even more accurate to say that the the, the the one truly effective spiritual path is stumbled upon <laughs> by people in all these different contexts and they interpret it using the tools of their specific tradition. So meaning to say, whether it's Taoism or, or Christian mysticism or Tantra or anything else, we have examples of people who are awake using the tools of their tradition to try to talk about awakeness and how to actualize it. And then we have other people within the same exact tradition who are not awake. That is to say, they are simply dogmatic adherents of that tradition. And, and they're using very, very similar language. And you can't really tell the difference without um, some substantial awakeness yourself. Um, but 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 once you know the awakening process gets going for somebody, then they can tell the difference that that I'm talking about here. Um, and the reason it's hard is because again, it's the same language that's being deployed, but it's being deployed in different ways by the dogmatic adherent and by the the spiritually awake person. It's only superficially similar, but of course, most people are are, are superficial in their engagement, so they don't notice. So. In other words, it ha what we need as a, as a species, I think, is to recognize, first of all, first of all, that awakening is real. <laughs> you know, it, that it is an actual process that is as much physiological 
as it is spiritual. That is to say, it's a process that subsumes your whole humanity. And it, it well, someday we'll have studies, and it's already starting now, actually, but someday we'll have a, a, a proper array of studies showing the physiological and neurological correlates of this awakening process, which absolutely subsumes and impacts the whole of, of our humanity um, when it's authentic, right? When it's not just an ideology and or a religion or whatever. So then ultimately, I think we'll be able to map and say, okay, look, there's these stages. Now in the in the book there, in the enlightenment chapter, I give five stages, but this is not meant to be an authoritative map. This is the way it is, people. No, these are just five of the most commonly recognized stages in, in different spiritual traditions. And I would say they pertain to the spiritual path, the one spiritual path, which is... Um, discovered by individuals in these different traditions, but you could map it differently. You could absolutely map, you could say, no, there's seven stages. No, there's 10. No, you know, you could map it differently, but that's not the point. It's, it's not about this map or that map. It's about the fact that there's a singular process of awakening and the different maps are just highlighting different elements of that process. They're, they're breaking it down in different ways because what's one stage in one tradition could be broken into two stages in another tradition uh, and, and perhaps with pedagogical value. So this is really interesting once we see, okay, these maps, um, you know, when they emerge from lived experience of awakening, not from religious ideology, they, they all are attempts to map fundamentally the same terrain and that it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, it's possible within the terrain of awakening to sort of end up in a bit of a cul-de-sac um, and 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 think you've got to the end of the road. Um, not to say there's a literal end of the road, by the way. So that's it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but in other words, if we had this understanding uh, of the process of awakening as as it instantiates for all people, though sometimes in different orders, by the way, I should say the stages um, are, don't always come in the same order for, for each person, but they are fundamentally the same stages, whichever order they occur in, um, and, and they entail the same insights. Now, if we had that understanding, um, and it, it has to be developed in conversation over a, a lot more time, then there could be a total syncretism of practice. It, it, then it could be a wonderful free-for-all, meaning to say, if you're trying to actualize this particular stage of awakening, perhaps a practice from Taoism is going to help. Perhaps an insight from Kabbalah is going to help. Perhaps the words of a Christian mystic are going to help. Perhaps a particular tantric yoga practice is going to help. But it it's going to help in the context where where you have a sense of of the landscape, both what you've traversed experientially and what you haven't yet traversed, uh, at, at, which you know from the maps given to you by those who have traversed. Um, then you could the the syncretism like we want as much syncretism as possible in that context because who knows what's going to actually help or work for a given individual trying to take the next step in their um development that's not really exactly the right word but but the but the unfolding of this process um which can happen all by itself by the way it can just happen all by itself where the where you're just along for the ride and you're bare, you're just hanging on for dear life actually um but it, it doesn't happen by itself all the time for most people, meaning to say you kind of get stuck at a certain point and you need the next insight or the next or, or some key practice to break you through that stuckness. And that's where where the syncretism could be useful. But but of course, the analogy to MMA is going to is going to break down because we again, we need this underlying thing to make the syncretism effective which is the understanding of, of the path, which we're still in our infancy, I would say. <laughs> People like Ken Wilber notwithstanding, we're still in our infancy because we need much more malleable versions of the path rather than what, what Ken and other people have outlined in his books. 
um, where we understand the different forms of language that are pointing to the same thing and, and the different order that the stages could come in and still be valid and legitimate. Uh, so we need this much more organic, fluid, malleable map of the of the path of awakening um, that, that could then empower a radical syncretism, which, which is not currently uh, going to be very effective for, for most people. Yeah. I mean, as we, the, the analogy could be made between uh, awakening and combat effectiveness in the in the the, the, the martial arts ring. Mm. Um, you know what works. So it's, it, MMA is a kind of post ideological martial art form. Doesn't matter what what are, you can bring any ideas you like into the octagon uh, of UFC about how great your tradition is and your how ma your masters right. can do all this stuff. But if you get your ass kicked, that, <laughs> you know what I mean. And yeah. Um, so I think the same can apply to, uh, you know, the spiritual path in terms of awakening. It's it, the proofs in the pudding. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm very interested in undoing ideology, um, on an individual and collective, uh, way. I'm, a, I'm also interested in dismantling ideology. Uh, it's just that we have to make this very subtle and kind of difficult distinction between ideology and understanding mm. whereby somebody might think if i'm talking about an understanding of the spiritual path like the understanding that we must um uh, dismantle the ego meaning to say we must recognize that our self images are thoughts and they don't they don't actually constitute a self that a self isn't made of thoughts, that that recognition is the same in any version of the spiritual path, um, though it mo may be uh, dressed up again in different words, right? And and so somebody, if I'm teaching about that, oh, you, you, you know, you've got to dismantle the ego sooner or later on this path, somebody might think that's a doctrine. And, and, and that's the thing, you know, right? Because uh, a doctrine becomes easily ideology but it's not. It's an understanding of what's uh, a necessary part of this process that everybody who's undergone the process agrees about, even if they quibble over the exact uh, language, right? So, so that's the thing. Is you know what I mean? Because um, it's what I'm talking about is different from Hatha Yoga, which is analogous to MMA, where Hatha Yoga tradition says doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what you understand, just do these practices in this way and they will produce the goal. They will produce uh, enlightenment um, if you just do the practices in this way. But history has shown that, it, that that's not true. Like a lot of people have tried to do the exact practices in the exact way prescribed and they do not automatically become buddhas you know and, and that that's why in in non-dual shiva tantra for example they say that the view or the philosophical context of within which those practices are done are as important as the, as the practices and i think I, yeah. the thing i like yeah. about non-dual shiva tantra is that it the, the 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 view the 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 philosoph philosophical framework within which it's it sits within has been stripped down occam's razor has been used a lot on it you know and uh there's a kind of uh a very essential nature to it there's not a lot i mean yeah, d again this is a generalization because you will find ornate floweriness particularly in tibetan buddhism for you know as a kind yeah. of correlate to it but um the essence of it there, there is a version which um doesn't have a lot of what you might call religious beliefs in it um yeah yeah that's the version i teach because you can certainly find uh people teaching the same tradition in a much more religious way um but it doesn't but the tradition itself allows for both possibilities the tradition itself teaches a, a kind of direct path version of itself and a, a much more baroque version of itself yeah um i i've, I've got to prepare to teach a, a sanskrit mm. class soon i know you have many more questions yeah. in your in your little document there yeah well i mean i've I, there's 
one more i mean one more what time what time do you have to uh, do a hard Just stop a, i mean in a few minutes okay well um let's just leave it there because uh as you you can't just lightly touch upon any of these um <laughs> I, I will, probably not. <laughs> i'll just comment on this one rather than yeah. you go into but in under the chapter enlightenment one of the things you go into is the the, the problem the historical problem of translating Western scholars, uh, so I went to the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, where a lot of these ethnographers were trained, they went over to they weren't practitioners themselves, you know, uh, in most cases, they went to different countries, learn about these different traditions, and then they had to find words to describe what they were talking to translate what they're talking about. So you've talked about Ananda and those kind of things. They come up with some terms which create as many problems were well, probably more problems than they answers they they they, and they they answer anything enlightenment is one of them and i recently mm -hmm. interviewed uh roger walsh dr roger walsh and he said death to enlightenment <laughs> um <laughs> as a term <laughs> and i think there's one thing i just want to point out to people one that really took me up the the garden path was emptiness i think is a is a a very problematic translation of shunyata and mm -hmm. uh, i mean people can go to wikipedia and look up the term shunyata and there's so many different uh t translations of that but yeah uh, <laughs> that for me that was a very fertile chapter and there's 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 so many Bad, bad, I don't know. The people did the best they could at the time, but they're just ultimately bad translations of words that get stuck. Once people start using it, it's out there in the culture, and you can't bring it back and say, "Whoa, let's not run away, run away with this this term." Um, mm. So, uh, you have a website which has the kind of got all of it's, it's the as I say the beating heart of your teaching. And if you could just say what that is for people to find it, please. Yeah. It it's simple tantra illuminated.org tantra illuminated.org um and that is the place to go to to then find uh whatever you're interested in in this domain because that links to our learning portal as well as our live events and so on but the learning portal as you know has um a tremendous amount of material courses, workshops, uh, uh, you know, webinars, um, guided meditations, just a, a big library of material, embodiment practice, so much stuff. It, it's, you know, we're building it as a kind of attempt to, to give you everything you need um, or everything anyone could need <laughs> for the spiritual path, which means covering a lot of possibilities because, again, people have different... Um, aptitudes and different different things work for different people so it's a that's that's exactly what the tantric tradition tried to do is to provide hundreds of different practices so that each person would find a practice that really works in their constitution uh so in that sense that's part of what makes it different you know, it's very different from some Vedantic paths, which say, oh, just contemplate, you know, who am I or or just do this. You know, we provide an array of practices, not because you're expected to master all of them, but because as you kind of poke around amongst this um, uh, embarrassment of riches, you will find something that perfectly speaks to you um and and that's that's the key so if you're if you're willing to go on that adventure it, it really is a, a a wonderful path and a wonderful modality for people to explore so thank you yeah well thanks for sharing that and uh thank you for your massive output of work um and your yeah. generosity and your time today thank you so much thanks thanks ralph and uh ho hope we get a chance to talk some more sometime yeah Maybe when the next book comes out. <laughs> We've got seven more conversations. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care. Love. I made all the music that I use in my podcasts.
If you'd like to hear more, please go to soundcloud.com and look up Ralph Cree.